Star Wars 7x7 episode 1787 today. We're going to wrap up our coverage of the Vanity Fair Star Wars Rise of Skywalker exclusive. And additionally, something that happened to come across my radar as well about The Mandalorian that was also in Vanity Fair 2. Let's go. Hey Rebel Rouser, I'm Alan Voivod and this is Star Wars 7x7. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode. <laughs> if uh, you're catching the video version of this and I look a little bit unkempt, well, let's just say that it was rather a heck of a day partying with Brainstormer Lonnie for her birthday yesterday and she has not lost a step, <laughs> let me tell you. So yeah, it's been a <laughs> bit of a recovery day, Saturday was, but anyway. Um... <laughs> So, let's talk about some of those last details in the Vanity Fair stories about the rise of Skywalker. First of all, one of the things that was mentioned by the author of the lead piece, Lev Grossman, is that we're going to find out more about the origins of the First Order. And, you know, we know a lot about it already. I mean, we know about the contingency, which was Emperor Palpatine's plan for what should happen to the Empire if it turned out the Empire was not strong enough to survive. And the fact that he sent one of his Star Destroyers along with a hand-selected group of people out into the unknown regions to be able to survive and thrive and create the next level of the Empire, which would be the First Order. And we also know from the Bloodline novel by Claudia Gray that there was a group of senators that were working in secret to support this rise of the First Order. But beyond that, we don't know a heck of a lot. Uh, we know some of the methodologies. We know that they were scouring planets in the unknown regions for children that they would abduct and indoctrinate into the First Order and things of that nature. But... You know, beyond that, not so much. So I think there probably are some pieces to connect and it might be interesting to see how the First Order actually rose in power, how it's connected to all of these additional planets that were working in secret to essentially undermine the New Republic for all intents and purposes. I mean, at some point they wanted to create stronger central control and maybe what the whole centrist philosophy was, was that they ultimately wanted to see the New Republic sort of become the First Order and that the First Order from a military standpoint would infiltrate it and maybe eventually Supreme Leader Snoke would have taken over as that quote-unquote first senator idea that they had in Bloodline. But yeah, ultimately I think the New Republic would have just been washed away regardless of what all of these centrist senators had been trying to do in Bloodline and maybe we're going to find out more about that in The Rise of Skywalker. Something else that we find out and it's probably one of the most teasing bits of information is that allegedly the force bond between Kylo Ren and Rey goes much deeper than any of us had thought, quote unquote. And one of course wonders, what the heck could that possibly mean? So what we do know is that they didn't really seem to have much of a force bond other than the one that Kylo Ren sort of forged himself when he was trying to break into Rey's mind in The Force Awakens, and maybe it was that breaking and entering that sort of enabled Supreme Leader Snoke to be able to forge the connection that he did between the two of them in The Last Jedi, or maybe he was just powerful enough to do that regardless. But be that as it may, you know, it leads you, of course, to speculate what does this mean about the Force bond that they share. And... You know, that could go a couple of different ways. First of all, if you're wondering whether they're related, well, we have to remind you of the fact that Ben is much older than Ray, so like by about 10 years or so. So yeah, at the very least, they're not twins like Luke and Leia were. And then if you were to try to suggest that they are siblings of some kind, then you have to assume that Han or Leia cheated on the other one, and I think that would probably be a hugely controversial idea if that was ever suggested. So I'd like to propose another option for this idea, and that would be prophecy, okay? So Lucas had previously described the sequel movies as being more ethereal, in other words, meaning more you know, not of this world, more spiritual in nature, more delicate in its construction and whatnot. 
And the prequels touched on prophecy, of course, with the prophecy of the Chosen One that Qui-Gon believes is being fulfilled through Anakin Skywalker. So if you're going to talk about tying things back into the prequel era stuff, as this movie is supposed to do, it's supposed to be able to wrap all the threads of everything together, then you would imagine that maybe prophecy could be a part of this as well under those conditions. Now, the actual prophecy of the Chosen One was revealed in the novel Master and Apprentice by Claudia Gray that came out last month, and there's nothing really in there that jumps out at you and suggests that, hey, it's going to play a role in The Rise of Skywalker. It just says, the Chosen One shall come, you know, born of no father, and through him, ultimate balance in the Force will be restored. So, you know, one thing that's sort of specific is the gender thing. It says, through him, balance will be restored. And then, additionally, it says, born of no father. So, I suppose if you wanted to, you know, throw out some theories, you could say, well, what if it turned out that that wasn't talking about Vader and Anakin Skywalker, was actually talking about Ben Solo? What if it turned out that he actually was not conceived by Han Solo either? That that Leia just became pregnant randomly, but because of the fact that they were husband and wife, that, you know they thought it was the case. You know, maybe this is some secret it'll turn out that Leia's been keeping is that, I don't know what happened, but it was immaculate, just like it was with Anakin. I suppose that's a possibility too. But yeah, I don't think that's too likely. So I think we're probably dealing with prophecy more than anything else, but I'd love to hear what you think about it. So drop me a line wherever you happen to catch this episode and there's a comment section or at home base for the website at sw7x7.com. Now, before we are done with Vanity Fair, I do want to mention the fact that as I was looking for Star Wars Rise of Skywalker stories, I also stumbled across something about The Mandalorian that I thought was worth sharing with you, and so I will do that after the break, so stay tuned. Hey there. If you're enjoying all the coverage that I'm bringing you from Star Wars Celebration and what I do every single day for you at Star Wars 7x7, I hope you'll consider putting something in the tip jar at patreon.com slash sw7x7. One dollars, 327, 501 or more. Honestly, every little bit helps and every little bit is just as exciting as every other little bit. Please consider supporting me in the work of delivering Star Wars stories and interviews to you on a daily basis at patreon.com slash sw7x7. Welcome back. So, Werner Herzog is playing the role of some sort of high-level former Imperial in The Mandalorian. Somebody who has managed to escape being captured and brought to justice by the New Republic. He is, you know, God knows where, somewhere on the outer edges of the galaxy, causing all sorts of havoc, or at least about to. And as the Cannes Film Festival is happening right now, it turns out that Werner Herzog is there. And naturally, because he's in Star Wars now, he's going to be asked about Star Wars. And so he was asked about his role in The Mandalorian, and this is what he had to say. He said, I asked for the full screenplays, and I looked into the part, and it looked good and interesting. The only reason for having me in the film, I know it's not a film, but, is they needed somebody who would spread terror and be frightening for the audience, he said. I said, yes, I think I can give you this stylization. It came with great ease, unquote. And I have to tell you, I swear, I wish there was a video or an audio version of this interview because nobody delivers that kind of stuff like Werner Herzog does. As far as why this particular gentleman would be in The Mandalorian, why he would even have anything to do with Star Wars when he said also in the interview that he only had a very vague idea of what the movies were all about, was that he needed money for his movies, which are generally not the blockbuster kind. And so he happens to have a movie at con right now that he financed with some of the first paychecks that he got from The Mandalorian. And that's going to do it for this episode as well. Thank you so much for joining me for it, as always. And may the Force be with you, wherever in the world you may be. This podcast is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox. It is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other related Star Wars items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited or their respective trademarks and copyright holders. May the Force be with them. All original content is copyright 2019 by Star Wars 7x7. We hope you love it.